every time you see a theological date uh, document produced, it is in response to some kind of false teaching. And so understand what I'm saying here. The theology only gets produced in response to the heresy and the false teaching. That's when the church says, let's write down what we've always believed to be true. All right, here's what I want us to see tonight. The 27 books of the Bible that we call the New Testament were recognized as authoritative, God-breathed scripture from the earliest records of church history. It's, it's really amazing. We don't actually have any record of any indication of any time period where any of these books were not recognized in some way as authoritative scripture. There were debates about some, whether they should make it into scripture or not. Um, and we'll talk about those debates a little bit, but they were, um, uh, th th those are only a handful of books. So we're talking about uh, 2 Peter, Hebrews, Jude, uh, and a, and a um, debate about the book of Revelation. And the debate always came down to, can we know for certain that an apostle had a hand in this book? And if an apostle had a hand in this book, then there's no doubt this is authoritative. So these books from our earliest records are treated in the same level, the same way that the Hebrew Scriptures are treated, the Old Testament Scriptures are treated. These books, the earliest records that we have, and the only records that we have, indicate that these books were treated in just that way. So um, just to review, we're talking about a process called canonization. That is the way that books come to be recognized as uh, Scripture not determined to be Scripture, but recognized to be Scripture. God's the one who determines their Scripture. We just recognize the determination that God has already made. And so it comes from the Greek, uh, from the Latin word canon, which is based off of an earlier Greek word, which means cane, which was a measuring stick. And so it's the idea of taking a, any particular book, so, um, so the Gospel of Thomas, which is not in Scripture, the Gospel of Thomas, and putting it up against the measuring stick and going, wait a second, that doesn't pass the, the measurement. It's not the same. And so therefore it does not belong in the New Testament. And we'll talk about some of those books that didn't make uh, our Bibles and why they didn't make our Bibles and why they didn't measure up. But these books, we're talking about the ones who, who did measure up. Uh, God's people did not determine which books would become Scripture. They recognized books that were already Scripture. So in thinking of the New Testament, we talked about the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures in our, our last session. Uh, I want to ask this question. When were the individual books of the New Testament written down? That is really helpful in this discussion. Because let me tell you kind of how this is presented. This is presented in this way. Well, Jesus was, you know, born uh, around 0 A.D., and which doesn't even make sense. 0 A.D. doesn't exist, but that's the way people think of it. 0 A.D. He was born around that time. And then it wasn't until 325 years later, after all that stuff, that we determined what books would be in the Bible and who knows in 325 years what could have even happened between three, that and, and 325 years later, who knows what could even happen. That's kind of a real popular common way of thinking about this issue. And the first thing we need to realize is those dates are really, really wrong. So you probably right away go, okay, we're not talking about zero. We're not talking about when Jesus was born. We're talking about when Jesus died. But we're not just talking about when Jesus died. We're talking about can, and, and was resurrected and ascended to heaven. We're talking about can we build a bridge? Can we build an informational bridge, a, a chain of evidence, if you will, from that time until the time that we say, hey, this is the book that is God's Word. Can we build that, that bridge or that, uh, that chain of evidence? And so I want to start with this question of when was the New Testament written down because that will help us see how far back do we have to go. Is our starting point zero? Is it 30 or 33 A.D.? depending on what year you believe that uh, Jesus was crucified, resurrected, and ascended. You know, what do we have to go back here to? So looking at the book of Luke, the very opening verses of the book of Luke, and I have them there for you in your listening guide. Luke says this, he says, and I want you to notice, I'm going to point out some of the words as we read through this. Inasmuch as many have undertaken, all right? So just right off the bat, this tells us that Luke is not the first one to do this thing that he's about to tell us about. People have already done this. So Luke is coming along at a time after which people have already written down things about Jesus. So that tells us Luke is not the first. Now, of course, we know Matthew and Mark, it's pretty obvious when you start comparing the books that Matthew and Mark wrote first and Luke wrote after them. 
Uh, but maybe there were others even who wrote down things about the life of Jesus. There is some indication that there might have... We don't have any of the, uh, anything that, that survived of that, but that maybe, for instance, the Sermon on the Mount might have been written down and might have circulated separately among churches or maybe the Beatitudes. And so others had tried to put it down, but maybe they've not even written it. Maybe they've just memorized it, as we talked about with uh, students who studied under rabbis. But many have done this, so Luke is not the first one to do it to compile a narrative of the things that have been accomplished among us. Compile a narrative, some translations will say, to, um, to compose an account, to put together an account. So many have done this. They've already tried to kind of put the pieces together and, and write out what happened, to organize an account. And then he says, verse 2, Just as those who were from the beginning, eyewitnesses. All right, so Luke is saying, many have done this. They've put together an orderly account. They were eyewitnesses, so they were there. They saw what happened. So where did they get their information from? They were there. They wrote down what they saw. But not only that, they were eyewitnesses and then ministers of the Word. Now, we should not hear that in the same way that we would hear ministers of the Word today. Uh, I'm a minister of the Word. Pastors are ministers of the Word. We should hear it a little differently. Eyewitnesses and ministers of the Word... Yes, ministers of the gospel, men who preach the word, but, but they're not men who are opening a New Testament, right? The New Testament is not finished yet. Luke, they're not preaching from the gospel of Luke because the gospel of Luke doesn't exist yet. So ministers of what word? Well, ministers of the word given to them through Jesus. Multiple places in the New Testament that we're told that Jesus passed on to the apostles the teaching and then the apostles passed it on to us. So these were men who were given the teaching. Uh, we, again, this is speculation, but it fits well with first century um, tradition and history that as they were traveling with Jesus for three years, one of the things they were doing was memorizing his teaching. We do know, uh, Luke, the, the book of Luke tells us, that in those 40 days between when Jesus was resurrected and ascended, what did he do? He taught them the Old Testament scriptures concerning himself. So he took them through. Wouldn't you love to have taken that class, by the way? Wouldn't you love to say, Jesus is teaching a very quick 40-day course on how the Old Testament points to him as the Messiah. I mean, that would be a fantastic course. Well, they had that course for 40 days. It was a mini-mester. It was very fast. I'm not sure how big their papers had to be at the end. But basically what we have as a result of that is the New Testament. So when we say, man, I wish I was in that class, well, in some ways we can be because they wrote down for us the New Testament. They told us this. That's why there's so many Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament because those are the things that Jesus, uh, some of the things that Jesus taught them. So um, many have done this. They were eyewitnesses. They were also ministers of the word, ministers of the, uh, of the gospel that was delivered that Jesus taught them to pass on. So he says, then they were delivered. Those words were delivered to us. Who is us? The church. So they've been passed around. So Luke's gospel is not the first time the church has heard these things. Why is that important? Because if Luke tells some totally different story, the church is going to know it's not the correct story. Because there's already out there, by the time Luke is writing his gospel, there's already a chain of evidence, if you will, or a bridge all the way back to Jesus himself, to the eyewitnesses, to the ones who were commissioned to send this word. So he says, it seemed good to me. So I'm going to do this also, having followed all things closely for some time past. So that means Luke says, I've done my homework, and it seemed good to me to put down an orderly account. And Luke writes for his reasons, and as you compare the Gospels of Matthew, Mark uh, with the Gospel of Luke, you see not that he tells a different story, but that he emphasizes different things. And so we often talk about, Jew, uh, about Luke being the Gentile Gospel. And so, hey, there's a, and, and that would make a lot of sense, right? Because Luke was a traveling companion of Paul. So I need to write down this story in a way that has been, it's been told for Jewish audiences. I need to write it down in a way that would be, make better sense and, and be um, more applicable for Gentile audiences. It, that would make a lot of sense if that was, his, uh, that was the case. And especially since he's writing to a man named Theophilus. Theophilus may have been a person. He, he might also be a reference to the Gentile church. Some have said that. The name means city of God. So it very well could have been an individual's name. It could have been a group of people he was writing to. We, we don't know for certain one way or the other what it was. But um, we do know that he said, I'm doing this so that you 
will have certainty concerning the things that you have been taught. There it is again. So he's not teaching Theophilus anything new. He's teaching Theophilus what he already knows in a new way. Why is that important? It's important because there's not a gap between Jesus and the written Gospels. It's not as though Jesus was here and then 20 years later, out comes this story and for the first time, people are hearing about the miracles and the teachings of Jesus. That's the way some people present it. There is a significant amount of evidence in the New Testament that that is not the case. We'll cover that later in this, in this series. But there's a significant amount of evidence in the New Testament itself that that is not the case at all. This is part of that evidence. I mean, if you just read Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4 through these lens, you start to realize how much was already out there by the time Luke actually wrote his gospel. There's, a, there's so much information out there about the ministry and teaching of Jesus. And Luke says, I'm not telling you anything new. I'm just compiling my own orderly account to emphasize particular aspects of the story that I feel like need to be inter, uh, uh, emphasized at this point. Why is that important? Because it reminds us, again, that there, were, there are things out there that, that became written down that at first were not written down. But there came a point where these authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and eventually John said, you know, we need to write these things down and put them in writing. But the church already knew the story. The church already knew the story, and they already knew the teachings of Jesus, so that if somebody came along and started, for instance, teaching uh, a different version of some of Jesus' teachings, and Luke said, well, I'm, you know, I, for whatever reason, nobody has any good reason why Luke would do this, but I'm going to change the story. If Luke were to do that, he could not get away with it because the church already knows the story of Jesus. Um, when we're talking about the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we need to think of those in two different categories, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. Uh, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke were all completed before Paul's death. Now, I need to be clear, not all scholars agree with that. But I will tell you this, the only reason they do not believe that all the historical evidence, in my opinion, I'm, I'm biased, all the historical evidence points to a date before 67 AD. The only reason that they reject the historical evidence that points to that is they do not believe that Jesus could have predicted the destruction of the temple in, in 70 AD with such precision. They say, look at how accurately Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple. Therefore, it must have happened uh, this must have been written after the destruction of the temple. Now, I happen to believe Jesus, being the Son of God, could predict it with crystal clear accuracy as though He knew every single event that was going to happen because He did. So that's not a problem for me. So when I look at the historical evidence, I say, it has to have been before 67 AD. Uh, Paul was killed in 67 AD. He was martyred between 64 and 67 AD. Um, so more than likely, the book of Acts was finished, which Acts is Luke part 2. Uh, if, you, if you're familiar with the New Testament, uh, it's like you know the, the sequel to the book of Luke. He comes along and he says, Theophilus, I already wrote you the first part. Now I'm going to write you the second part. Uh, and then Matthew and Mark, it's clear that Luke is aware of Matthew and Mark as he's writing. And so you just back it up from there. It's got to all be before 67 AD, which is the latest date we can put for Paul uh, being martyred. Uh, so those are, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now John is much different. So John wrote much later. John wrote toward the end of his life. And, and actually, we don't know when he wrote the Gospel of John, but we do know that he wrote it later. There, there's some tradition around it that says he wrote maybe between 80 and 95, but we just don't have a date stamp. It's hard to put a date stamp on it. Uh, but we, we do know that he wrote, and there's a lot of indication that he wrote it after the temple was destroyed. And so that's why I put that date of 98 A.D. there. 98 A.D. is most likely the date of John's death. And so the one thing we know for certain about the Gospel of John is he had to write it before he died. So uh, 98 A.D. is that is that end cap. That is a very important date. So we want to hold. You'll actually see that date come up several times as we walk through the uh, the other parts of Scripture. So somewhere around 89 to 95, no later than 98 A.D., John wrote the fourth gospel. And then we have the book of Acts. The book of Acts, same with Matthew, Mark, and Luke, had to have been completed, most likely was completed before 67 AD. Then there are the epistles. Because of the order of our Bibles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, we don't often think about this, but the gospels were written after 
the epistles for the most part. Now, there were some epistles that were written later than the gospels, but for the most part, it was epistles first, gospels second, which, you know, you, you ought to spend some time thinking about that sometime. We start our understanding of Jesus with the basic stories, and the church did have those. But the first thing that God said, I want to put into writing, was actually the epistles. And uh, the first epistle, as far as, and, and these are all estimates, by the way, uh, as far as we know, would be the epistle of James. James died fairly early, and so the, uh, the epistle of James was written down somewhere around 40 to 45 A.D. It's hard to, uh, hard to be certain on that date. Uh, then there are the epistles of Paul. Uh, and when you date those, you date those according to his missionary journeys. We don't know exactly when his missionary journeys are, so there's some guesswork there. We do know that they were written before his death in 67 A.D., 67 being the latest that he could have been martyred. He was martyred by Nero. Nero was no longer the emperor after 68, and so 67 is the latest date that we can uh, realistically put for, for Paul's death. And then the other epistles were written down between 40 A.D., likely J that's about as early of a date as you can put for the book of James, and then 98. 98 again, death of John, very important number, um, and that is as late as 1st, 2nd, 2nd, and 3rd John could have been written. Uh, Revelation, again, John, uh, I believe John the Apostle wrote Revelation. There are others who, who believe it was another author. Uh, I don't really see much evidence for that. Uh, so the, um, that would put the, the writing as late as 98 A.D. So, so hold on to that 98 A.D. date in mind. But then also see how we have, a, we have a clear, if you would, chain of evidence. There's really no brokenness in this chain of evidence. There's Jesus, either 30 or 33 A.D., death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, the, the preaching starts. The preaching of the gospel starts. And remember, in order for, as Luke said, for these things to be written down, they've got to be circulated. So for Luke to do his research, for Luke to talk to eyewitnesses, for Luke to talk to these people that he says he talked to, there's got to be some circulation going on. So you've got to back up. You can't say, well, we have a gap there between the time Jesus went to heaven and the time that Luke wrote these things down. No, the gap is, is closed by the evidence that we have that these things were being circulated. When we get into, later on into uh, these sessions, we will talk about some of the creeds that are recorded for us in the, in the New Testament that we know predate. In fact, the, maybe the first book of the New Testament to be written chronologically is 1 Corinthians. It contains a creed in it, a creedal statement in it, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that Paul says, This I received. I received this. And then he gives us a poetic creedal statement of the gospel. So he got it from somewhere. The Corinthians already knew about it. So we've got to backdate that. That's pre-Paul. That's pre and remember, Paul is pre-Gospels, uh, chronologically speaking. So we have very literally almost, it, it's almost as though Jesus ascended and we have literary evidence of just a few days later, this piece of literature, 1 Corinthians 15, that has survived since that time. And, it, and by the way, it gives us all the basics of the gospel. Right there, we have it. There is nothing that in the New Testament that contradicts anything said in 1 Corinthians 15. So when it comes to the gospel message, we have a chain that goes all the way back to the lifetime of Jesus. Now, a critic might say that the, the followers of Jesus are lying. They might say that Jesus was lying. They might say that Jesus just made it all up and that somehow they faked his death, burial, and resurrection. There's a big problem with that. We'll actually talk about that in a couple of sessions. But it's difficult to say that this is not the message that Jesus taught or that the, the very early followers of Jesus received from him. It's almost impossible to be academically honest and, and say that. So we've got this chain all the way to, to 98 A.D., where, where John dies. And so um, that's, like I said, an, an important date. Uh, so, so now we have, okay, that's when it was written. But how did it come to be recognized as Scripture? Maybe Paul just thought he was writing a letter to his friends over in Galatia. Or maybe John just thought, this is a really good sermon. I should write this one down. And Maybe he thought of his letter the same way that I would think of one of my sermons. I would never say a sermon is at the level of authority as, as Scripture. And so maybe that's the way that they thought of it. Some critics have, 
have said that and that later we made it into something that it wasn't or that Constantine in 325 <coughs> made those into something that they never were intended to be. So how early then did the church start to think of these books as Scripture? When did the canonization process happen? Now again, uh, when we talked about the Old Testament, that process is somewhat lost to, script, to history, but we know that that was in place you know, 250 years before Jesus because of the, uh, the translation of the Septuagint. And then we know there was this official council, 90 AD, we talked about this, Council of, of Jomnia that said, yes, this is what we've believed for some time. We see the record of Josephus. But just like with the Old Testament, there was no, hey, everybody, let's gather together and let's make a decision today. We have no books that we consider Scripture. Now we have all the books that we consider Scripture. It was as though the nation of Israel was smart enough to know this is from God as soon as it was written down. But that process is lost to us because we don't have the documents to know exactly how that happened. We do have documents regarding the New Testament. And, and here's the amazing thing. It's, it's almost as soon as the ink was dry that the church starts to speak of these books that we call the New Testament as authoritative scripture from God. So we're going to go in reverse order. We're going to start with the latest dates and we're going to work our way back. Now there are people who will say uh, that, you know what, the church did not say that this book was scripture until the Council of Trent in 1546 A.D., They'll say in 1546 A.D., that's when the church invented the Bible. And they'll say that the Catholics invented it in 1546. The, uh, the Protestants invented it in 1563 as a response to the Council of Trent. And in 1647 with these different confessions of faith where they listed the books of the, of the New Testament and of, of Scripture. Now, there are many, many people, I've heard this many times. Well, the church invented the Bible at the Council of Trent in 1546. Uh, and so that's the latest date that you'll, you'll ever encounter. Well, there's some issues with that. 1546, if you know, you remember your history, is after the Reformation. 1513 is when Martin Luther nails the 95 Theses on the door at Wittenberg. One of the, um, one of the central facets of the Reformation is sola scriptura. You don't have to know Latin to know what that means. Scripture alone. So Scripture alone. So how could Martin Luther make a claim that Scripture alone is our guide if we didn't even know what Scripture was until 40 years later? How is that even possible? It doesn't make sense, let alone how could we be translating Bibles during that time? Now, the King James Bible wasn't translated until 1611, but there was the Geneva Bible that was translated in the later part of the 15th century. There's the Wycliffe translation, John Wycliffe, who translated the Bible into English and was persecuted for it. He did that in the 14th century. There's the Erasmus text that was put together. The Erasmus text is the Greek version of the New Testament that a man named Erasmus put together so all these translations could take place. And that was before the Council of Trent took place. There's the Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate was translated in 382 AD. So how could it be that we actually had a translation of a Bible we weren't even sure was a Bible until 1546 and we've had a translation of it since 382 AD? So that idea that we didn't know what the Bible was or that we declared the Bible to be the Bible in 1546 is, is not in any way, it holds no water once you, once you just even start to, to think about it a little bit. So we'll go from 1546 all the way back to 382 AD. Uh, Jerome translated the Vulgate. When he translated the, the Vulgate New Testament, guess what books were in it? Matthew to Revelation. Those were the books that Jerome translated in the Latin Vulgate. So by 382 AD, the church knew what the New Testament was. Back up to 367 AD. 367 AD, um, Athanasius wrote a letter, an Easter letter, and in his Easter letter, he said, these are the books that the church has always used. That's very important. He, he's not publishing a book, a list of books and saying, you know, this is my, these are my thoughts on the matter. He's saying these are the books the church uses. Guess what books he lists? The 27 books of the New Testament. He has a quote that I think is very important. Uh, this is what he says about other books. He says, there are other books besides these. So he lists the 27. And he says, beside these, not indeed included in the canon, 
but appointed by the fathers to be read by those who newly join us, who wish for instruction in the word of godliness, the wisdom of Solomon, the wisdom of Sirach, Esther. Uh, that's not the Old Testament book of Esther. Uh, that is a, a later book of Esther that's attributed to Esther, but not really written during that time. Judith and Tobit, which are called the teaching of the apostles and the shepherd. So the shepherd of Hermas, another book. So, so he says, these are good books that are written. You ought to read these. These can give you instruction in faith, but these are not the same as the 27 that I just listed. So that's in 367 AD. Um, Constantine ordered copies of the Bible to be uh, printed in 331 AD. And he didn't call them the Bible. He called them scriptures. But he wrote a letter to uh, Eusebius in 331 AD. I put an excerpt there. I won't read it to you, but I put an excerpt of that letter there where he says, I, w I would like for copies of the Bible uh, to be, uh, 50 of them to be made uh, for teaching in, in the churches. So will you make these copies? Uh, it makes co perfect sense. You can't make copies of a book that you don't know what it is. And so 50 copies of the Bible are ordered by the emperor in 331 A.D. Then there's the Council of Nicaea itself. The Council of Nicaea is what Dan Brown says, well, this is when the Bible was put together. Well, the Council of Nicaea did occur. Uh, Emperor Constantine did call for the Council of Nicaea, but there is absolutely no record. There, there are many written things that come out of the Council of Nicaea. So we have, we have lots of writing that took place, the Council of Nicaea. Not once do any of those writings discuss which books should or should not be in the New Testament. They were uh, addressing the issue, the, the heresy of Arianism. And so uh, there's no discussion anywhere about the canon of Scripture. But here's, here's what is interesting at the Council of Nicaea as they are addressing Arianism. Arianism is the idea that Jesus is not fully God, that, he's, uh, that he, is, he is just a, uh, a human and so it's, it's about the nature of Jesus. So here's the interesting thing. As they're addressing this heresy, guess what they quote? The New Testament. They quote it as authoritative. They quote from the books that you and I read. So when they are quoting the New Testament, uh, when they're quoting their authoritative sources, then they're quoting the New Testament that you and I know and love, which means by that time, by 325, it was already really well established. If you want to win a theological argument, how do you do it? You do it by going to the New Testament. This is our source of authority. Already established by that time and absolutely zero historical record that the Council of Nicaea did anything regarding the, um, the New Testament. However, I've given you a quote there. Uh, I gave you the authoritative quote from the fictional book by Dan Brown called The Da Vinci Code. Well, let me take you to an even more authoritative source, Twitter. So I've given you, uh, given you a Twitter quote there from March of 2018 by a guy who takes a really funny way to spell the uh, word positive atheism. That is his uh, account name. And so here's what he says. The Holy Bible, texts of shady origin collected by competing bishops on order of politically motivated Roman Emperor Constantine to stabilize his empire and since then repeatedly adapted to suit the needs of contemporary rulers and clergy, but never made to comply with reality. That's what he said in 2018. Now, if you read that tweet, there are plenty of people who are saying, who are affirming what he's saying, which means that with zero historical evidence, they are taking an idea repropagated in the 21st century by a fictional book called the Da Vinci Code, and they're saying, see, Constantine is the one who put the Bible together. The church really didn't know what the Bible was before that time, and Constantine determined what, what the Bible would be for his political purposes. But the historical facts just do not add up. Uh, then, th then there's a fragment from 170 AD, and a fragment is just a, a piece of writing that is not complete. So it could be, sometimes they're very small, and they only have a few words on them. Sometimes they're almost an entire uh, sheet of paper and from a book, but they've been ripped out. Well, that is, the, that is the deal with this particular fragment, is it's almost a complete sheet of paper, but a small portion of it is torn out, so it's called a fragment. But the moratorium fragment, uh, again, uh, somewhere around 170 A.D., it has a list of books used for public worship. So it gives us a list of books for public worship. It doesn't say these are the books that belong in the Bible simply because that word Bible was not a word that was in constant use. It was more uh, Scripture. So they would say the word Scripture 
uh, when the Greek word for scripture and then eventually the Latin word for scripture before we use the word uh, Bible, which just comes from the Greek word that means book. Once these be started being put together in what is called a codex, this is a codex. It's not a scroll, it's a codex. But remember at this time, this is expensive. This is really expensive. Somebody has estimated that around the turn of the uh, first century that to put together something like this would cost you around twenty thousand dollars in in modern money. So you couldn't just as a poor church, especially as a poor Christian, say, yeah, give me five Bibles and I'll pass them out, you know, to five people that I love. I'd love to get a, uh, I mean, how many Bibles do I have in my office? How many do you have at home? That just wasn't the case. So what did churches have? They had books that they circulated from one church to another, and it was very expensive to hire a scribe to write these down and pass them along to other churches. So you might have a copy of Romans for a few months, and then you might mail that off to another church, and that church might mail you a copy of Ephesians. And while you have it, you're going to have a scribe in your church write it down and, and keep it so that your church now has a copy of Ephesians. So this fragment, we don't know who it's written by, uh, but this fragment says, let me give you a list of books that are used in public worship. And so it lists almost all of the New Testament books. It doesn't list Matthew and Mark, but that's the part of the fragment that's broken off. So more than likely, he says Matthew and Mark. He picks up at Luke and he says, um, he says the third one being Luke, which means there were two before Luke. It would be almost impossible to imagine that it was anything other than Matthew and Mark before Luke, but we've lost that piece of the fragment, so we don't have that. He does not include Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, and 2 Peter. Now, he doesn't say that they're not Scripture, they don't belong in the Bible. He's just listing books for use in public worship. It does include two books that are not in our New Testaments. One is the Wisdom of Solomon. Um, he doesn't make any comment about that, but the other is the Apocalypse of Peter. And he makes a very interesting comment about the Apocalypse of Peter. He says, uh, he gives a warning. He says, now this apocalypse of Peter is, yes, something that some churches use. Now, again, he's not giving an authoritative list. He's just saying, here are books that ch some churches use. So he mentions the apocalypse of Peter, but he says, be careful about this particular book. It is, uh, it is not certain that it was written by Peter. And, of course, there are later sources that make it very clear that th that book was not written by Peter. He also includes the Shepherd of Hermas. You've heard of that. That was a very, it's kind of like a pilgrim's progress of the early church. Shepherd of Hermas comes up over and over again. It's a really great book. Would encourage you to read it. But listen to what he says about the Shepherd of Hermas. He says, it ought also to be read, but it cannot be made public in the church to the people, not meaning that they can't see it, but this is not something for public worship is what he's saying. He's saying, nor placed among the prophets, that would be the Old Testament, as their number is complete, nor among the apostles. So this doesn't belong with the Old Testament books. It doesn't belong with the New Testament books, but it's a good book. It'll help your people. It just does, it's just not a part of public worship. Then there's Marcion. Uh, Marcion is a bad guy, all right? And, uh, but he's very helpful. Uh, let me tell you why Marcion was a bad guy. Marcion was the first heretic outside of the New Testament. There's some in the New Testament recorded for us. Uh, but the first one that was addressed by the church after the New Testament era uh, that we know of. And, and boy, he was, a, he was a serious one. His, um, his heresy lasted for somewhere around 100 years, even after he died. Someone has said, basically what Marcion said is we need to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. Sound familiar to anybody? Uh, so, okay. So, like I said, there are no new heresies. They are only new, uh, old heresies that continually reinvent themselves. So Marcion said, the God of the Old Testament, way too mean, way too judgmental. That it, there's no way the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. So he set about cleansing the New Testament of any Old Testament references. And so when he, what he did is he said, well, we can't have the Gospels. The Gospels won't do. They're way too um, connected to the Old Testament God. So he wrote his own Gospel but it's an edited version of Luke. So he went through the Gospel of Luke and he took out so many of the Old Testament references. Then he said, there are these 10 letters of Paul. He really liked Paul because Paul talks a lot about grace, but he only took 10 of Paul's letters and he went through Paul and he would take out references to the Old Testament. And then he said, the rest of the epistles, they're no good. They talk too much about judgment, too much. They sound too much like the Old Testament. So he's a very bad guy. 
A um, couple of things about him, though, that are very important for this discussion of how early did the church recognize these books as the authoritative Word of God as Scripture. So this is happening. Uh, Marcion does this between 130 and 140. He goes to join the church at Rome. He makes a donation to the church at Rome in the amount of about 100 years worth of wages. He's a very wealthy man. He makes a donation to the church at Rome, joins the church at Rome, and starts teaching these things. Well, they very quickly excommunicate him and give him back his gift. Now, I need to be clear at our church. We will excommunicate you for heresy, but we will consider whether or not to return your gift. We <laughs> may, in fact, hold on to it for the glory of God and His kingdom, but we will excommunicate you for heresy. So they said, hey, you can take the gift back. And why did they do it? They did it because they said, you cannot teach this. So you see how his, even though he's the earliest list, he's the, he, and he made a list. He said, here, here are the books that, that the only books we should hold on to as authoritative. The church's reaction to him tells us what? They didn't like his list. Why didn't they like his list? Because he took out books that they already knew were authoritative. They're already treating them as scripture. And this guy comes along and says, well, i tell you what you can't do. Use Matthew, Mark, or John, and only my edited version of Luke. You can only use a certain number of books from Paul. You can't use any of the other epistles. And the church said, that is heresy. That is not what we teach. You're not welcome here. And he was condemned as a heretic uh, very broadly. He's the most, one of the most broadly con condemned heretics in all of church history. Everybody said what this guy teaches is not what we believe. So although you can't find a, a list where John says, the Apostle John says, here are all the books you should read, I want you to also think about this. Why does theology arise? Theology arises the same, for the same reason today that it did back then. It arises in response to an issue. So if we were to look back and say, well, I wonder what uh, the church in the 13th century thought about uh, transgenderism. Well, we might find a bit here or there. There may be something written about it, but it's just not an issue. Nobody at that time is claiming that God is okay with transgenderism. Now look at the church in the 21st century. There is much being written about the church, about transgenderism in the church in the 20th, uh, 21st century. Why? Because it's a current issue. We've never had to address this before. Sometimes people will say things like this. Well, the Southern Baptist Convention believed that women could be pastors right up until the year 2000. That's not true. It's not true at all. It had just never been an issue. We, it never made it into our statement of faith because it had never been a serious issue. It became a serious issue, and we said we need to speak definitively about what we believe about this. Same thing with Scripture. Same thing with the role of the church. Every time you see a theological date, uh, document produced, it is in response to some kind of false teaching. And so understand what I'm saying here. The heresy only gets produced after the false te oh, excuse me, the theology only gets produced in response to the heresy and the false teaching. That's when the church says, let's write down what we've always believed to be true. The early church did not start believing Jesus was God with the councils. They did not start believing that Jesus was fully God, fully human with the councils. That was just the first time anyone had ever taught that those things weren't true. And they said, hold on just a second. That's not what we believe. We need to write these things down so that we have clarity on what we actually believe. So when we go back to Marcion's list and we see him make this list of books that should go in the New Testament and to see them be completely rejected by the church, what does that tell us? They did not like his edited list. This is not what we believe. We have always believed these things to be Scripture. Bear with me. We're going to go back even further. That's 130 A.D. that we have this list. Do you see how close we are to 98 A.D.? That doesn't mean the list didn't exist. That means they haven't survived. These are actual documents that have survived, and we have record of them. What documents didn't survive that verify the same information that is given to us by these documents, but we're going to go even further back. Clement of Rome, he wrote around 95 AD. He wrote letters to some of the same people that Paul wrote letters to. Uh, he was, he, uh, if more than likely, the same guy mentioned in Philippians chapter 4. He knew Paul, very likely who Paul is talking about in, in Philippians chapter 4. Um, when he writes, guess what he cites as authoritative sources? Just to name a few. Matthew, Acts, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1 Timothy, Titus, Hebrews, 1 Peter, and James. So he is citing the New Testament in his letter 
He's saying you need to listen to these things and he's citing the New Testament as authoritative scripture. Then he distinguishes himself from the apostles. He says you need to understand that I am not an apostle. I'm not writing with that kind of authority. So he says, I have the quote for you there in your notes. The apostles received the gospel for us from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was sent forth from God, so then Christ is from God, and the apostles are from Christ. Both therefore came of the will of God in their appointed order, having therefore received a charge, and having been fully assured through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, and confirmed in the word of God with full assurance of the Holy Ghost, they went forth with glad tidings that the kingdom of God should come. So he says, Jesus came, He passed it to the apostles, the apostles have passed it to us. That's how we got what we have, which is what we have recorded in our New Testament. Then there's a book called Second Clement. Now Clement more than likely did not actually write this book. We don't know who wrote it, but somebody in the church wrote it. And here's what uh, Second Clement says. He says, I do not suppose you are ignorant that the living church is the body of Christ. For the scripture says, God made man, male and female. All right, what is that? That's Genesis, right? So we've quoted Genesis. Now listen to what he does. The male is Christ and the female is the church. Where did he get that idea from? Ephesians chapter 5. So Ephesians chapter 5, and he says, And the books and the apostles plainly declare that the church exists now and for the first time, but hath been from the beginning. He's saying, actually, God had this plan for the church from the very beginning, and both the Word of God, and he quotes Genesis 1, and then here's what the apostles have to say. And what I want you to see is he holds them on the same level of authority. Now, it's not just... Clement. We're all the way back to 95 A.D., uh, but it, I, I, want, I want to give you one more um, source, and then I want to get to the actual New Testament, because the actual New Testament, going back before 98 A.D., gives us this declaration. But I, but I want you to know that the books of the New Testament were considered Scripture from virtually the moment they were written for one reason. They came from the apostles. The apostles wrote it. They received it. And it seemed to them to carry the same authoritative weight as Scripture because it came from the apostles. Now, there are three ways the word apostle is used in the New Testament in the early church. And it's very important for us to, to remember. So there's the apostles, meaning the group of men. We call them the disciples. But almost always the New Testament calls them apostles. Even in, uh, it's funny how we're trained to read things, we'll read the Gospels and not realize that they continually call them the apostles, not the disciples. Only a couple of times are they called the disciples. So those 12 men who were with Jesus, of course Judas leaves, Matthias uh, comes as his replacement. But those 12 men are often referred to as the apostles. But there is a second group, those who were with Jesus and commissioned by him to establish the church. Now that includes the 12 minus Judas plus Matthias, but it also includes James, James the brother of Jesus, who was not one of the twelve while Jesus was, uh, was during his earthly ministry, but the Bible says he appeared to James and to all the apostles. And of course James writes one of the books of the New Testament. James became, he's called an apostle several times in the book of Acts. He became the leading apostle there in the church at Jerusalem. But it's very important in order to qualify as an apostle, which rules out all modern day apostles by the way, you have to have had an encounter with the risen Christ, a physical encounter with the risen Christ. So you were with Jesus and you saw him as an eyewitness to his resurrection. That's why Paul says, I was one unnaturally born. He did see the risen Christ, but not during the 40-day period between, um, between death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. No, he saw him on the road to Damascus. So he says, I am an apostle, but I'm one unnaturally born. And he says, I'm the least of the apostles, which can also be translated last, by the way, last of the apostles. So there's this group of authoritative people. It includes James, it includes Paul. Barnabas is called an apostle at one point, And possibly Jude is referred to as an apostle, although he's not mentioned by name. Uh, it's mentioned brothers, plural of Jesus, would be James. And uh, the assumption is that he's speaking of Jude also. And then the word is used of sent out ones. The word apostle comes from the word epistle, just means letter. It means something sent out, a message sent out. So there are times that word is used where it doesn't refer to the office of apostle, these authoritative men. But that word 
that, that comes to mean the office is mentioned many times outside of the New Testament by the early church. And it's clear that a line of distinction is drawn between Clement writing a letter to whatever church and between the, the authoritative um, word that is coming from the apostles. Ignatius, um, he wrote before 10, uh, 108 A.D. How do we know that? He died in 108 A.D. So uh, he died around the turn. Uh, he's writing around the turn right there of the, of the second century before 108 A.D. And here's what he says. He wrote to many of the same churches that Paul wrote to. So he wrote to Ephesus. He wrote to Rome. Uh, and here's what he said. He said, I did not think myself competent for this, being, uh, that being a convict, I should order you as though I were an apostle. You see how he just, and he does this multiple times in his letter. He distinguishes himself. He says, I'm writing to you, but it's not the same way that Paul wrote to you. It's not the same way that the apostles wrote to you because I don't have that kind of authority. Now, finally, we get back to the New Testament. So we're all the way back to, and if we look at Clement, John is still alive. So the apostolic authority is, of the church is still there in John. John has not died. And we have Clement already saying the New Testament is, is the New Testament is authoritative and it's different from what I write. But then we go back into the New Testament itself. One of the coolest places in all of Scripture, because you start to think, well, wait, there were some people who weren't apostles, like Luke. Luke was not one of the twelve. And so you say, well, well can we count Luke as Scripture? It's almost as though God knew that question was going to come up. First Timothy, Paul quotes the book of Luke, and he quotes it as Scripture. First Timothy Chapter 5, verse 18. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. That second quote in some of your Bibles will be in red because it is a statement of Jesus. It comes from the Gospel of Luke. So Paul, Timothy's, I mean Luke's traveling companion, quotes his traveling companion, and he quotes him as scripture. And then there's one of my favorite verses in the New Testament uh, where Peter, in 2 Peter, calls Paul's writings as Scripture. I like it for two reasons. One, because he says that Paul's writings are Scripture. So Peter believed that Paul's writings were Scripture. But I also like it because he says, I've got to admit something. Sometimes it's hard to understand what Paul wrote. I read that and I go, hey, if Peter had a hard time understanding some things that Paul wrote, I, I don't feel so bad. So here's what Peter says. He says, Count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist their own destruction, as they do, there it is, the other scriptures. So they twist Paul just like they twist the other scriptures. So we don't even have to go beyond the New Testament time period to see that, that almost by the time the ink was dry, these writings that we call the New Testament were accepted as authoritative scripture. Every single piece of historical evidence that we have over and over again underlines and emphasizes that the New Testament has been received as scripture from the day that it was written.